Hello and welcome to Yodo. I'm Dr. Sarah Bohm and today I've put together a topic because I've had a lot of questions about end-of-life care and what actually happens at the end of life and how does palliative care work for somebody that's got serious illness that's nearing the end of life and what if I don't choose to be on hospice and I just have palliative care. All of hospice is palliative, but not all palliative is hospice. Palliation is the alleviation of symptoms, and usually it's addressed by a team, as we've talked about before. We want to have that team address people's needs, whether it's the patient or the family, for uh, symptoms, whether it's pain, constipation, shortness of breath, swelling, but try to make every day a better day. And then we also want to address any family symptoms as a lot of them are suffering inside. We want to take care of any psychosocial issues that the patient and the family have. Take care of everybody together. Hospice is really similar, but hospice is more involved and CMS, most insurances, the VA, all pay for hospice care, which is a team of people that are going to come by where you are. It's a service. It's not a location. And so you'll have not just the physician and a nurse practitioner, but you'll have a nurse, usually RN, possibly RN and LPN. You'll have an aide, uh, chaplain, social worker, possibly pharmacist, nutritionist, depending on what the patient's and family's needs are. And we certainly have um, mental health help. We have those clinical social workers. So when somebody's life expectancy is limited, that's when they choose hospice. And as that time draws near and they get closer and closer to the end of life. That specialty care becomes more and more important to have that whole team involved with that person's care. So when a patient has a limited life expectancy and cure is no longer possible, we still wanna care for them and we still wanna manage their symptoms. And it doesn't mean that the patient can't go back to the hospital anymore. The hospice's goal is to keep the patient out of the hospital because they've been there and cure can't be offered. And for many patients, they don't want to go back to the hospital when that time draws down to those last few days and those last few hours. That's when it's really imperative for them to want to be at home. The dying experience depends on a lot of different factors, not just for the patient and their beliefs and their symptoms, but their spirituality, their medical condition, as well as what the family needs are and how able are they to take care of this individual in the home. Now, it doesn't have to be the patient's home. It could be a relative's home. It could be a neighbor's home. It could be an assisted living, a nursing home. So there are lots of different home environments. That team goes to where that patient is and meets that patient and family meets their needs in that location. So the patient has addressed their advanced directives. They've been informed that their life is getting short and many times you can see end of life coming. They can see it days in advance, sometimes even weeks in advance where the patient is eating less, they're sleeping more, they have less interest in other activities. The TV may be on for background noise or to kind of keep them company because it's familiar and it gives them kind of a comfort inside, but they may not really be watching those television programs, whether it's the news or a Disney channel. They may not be watching that stuff anymore. So you're gonna to wanna to have that channel onto something that's soothing. And sometimes that's just music, just background music or a video that is comforting to that person. But that individual and the family have already gone through their advanced directives. They've made it clear, this is what I want. This is how I want to be cared for. These are the things that have become the most important to me as end of life approaches. And I know where I want to be and I know how I want to be cared for. There are patients who accept hospice who when that time nears, they don't want to be cared for at home anymore. They want to go back to the hospital. They, they choose to be placed on machines. But more often than not, patients don't want to be in that kind of a sterile hospital environment at the end. They want to be in their own place, in their own home, with their things about them. The little girl with red shoes said it best. There's no place like home. And I know a lot of people have that home sweet home. So when your time gets short and you're not feeling well, home is where a lot of people want to be. Patients realize that there are certain interventions and certain treatments that they can't have at home. 
It's not really easy to get CPR. You can't have a ventilator. You're not gonna get blood transfusions. You might have artificial nutrition, but it kind of depends on the clinical situation. Some patients do have artificial nutrition at the end of life, particularly if they've had prior stroke or maybe ALS, or they've got some feeding issue. Maybe they have had a cancer in their swallowing tube or GI cancer, but some cancers, we really can't put feeding tubes in them. If it's a, a stomach cancer and they still have tumor there, they may not be able to navigate being able to put a feeding tube around that. So sometimes feeding, artificial feeding is not really a possibility for some patients. And what we do is we manage those symptoms of hunger and, and we do what we can to help that patient be comfortable as end of life nears. As you can imagine, there are a lot of physical changes that occur at the end of life, a lot of emotional things that are happening, not just with the patient, but with the family, and the communication style may change. I know sometimes when I've made house calls on patients that are very near the end of life and there's minimal communication left, sometimes it's the, the family without words can read what's happening to that patient and they can interpret for me. Certainly they can tell me what's been happening the last few days. I can see with my eyes, I'm gonna do an exam on that person, but also they can feel inside that their loved one is comfortable or not, that their loved one is anxious or not. So a lot of that, we actually rely on the family to tell us about not just their mental health needs, their spiritual needs, but also on their physical needs. Many times I've been told by patients that they don't fear being dead, it's the process of dying that they really are afraid of. And so with them, I will talk with them about what that's going to look like and how that's going to be for them. And they can get some consolation, some relief in kind of knowing a little bit more about what that's going to look like for them. They're going to sleep more, eat less, be awake less. And instead of you know being awake 12 or 14 hours a day, they may actually sleep 20 or 22 hours a day and only have periods of wakefulness. Their needs become less. They might need more pain medication. They might need something for anxiety. But a lot of times when they're not taking as much by mouth, their body chemistry changes a little bit. And sometimes those symptoms can actually be a little bit easier to maintain or to manage some of those symptoms so that maintaining comfort becomes a little bit more easy for the patient. And then the family can also be more comfortable. We want to honor and respect the needs of the patient and the needs of the family, their cultural beliefs, their spiritual beliefs. And so we have hopefully by this time had enough of a chance to meet that patient and meet that family and find out what those needs are so that as the end of life nears, we can be better prepared to provide for those needs. Quite some time ago, a writer, author, research person, Kubler-Ross, put together the stages of grief that occur with a typical approach of the end of life. And it, these five stages, you don't go through in any particular order, but there's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And so you may think you've accomplished one stage and then you go back to it again. So completing one stage to, does not necessarily mean you won't go through that stage or experience that again. And it can be for the patient as well as for the family. So expect those five stages of grief to occur, those five stages for preparing for loss to occur, and then after the loss, you may also still notice you're still going through those stages. Patients and families many times have told me that they get conflicting messages from the various physicians that they're seeing. They may be seeing a primary provider, they may be seeing a couple of specialists, and they'll feel like they were told that things were doing well. They don't feel like they were adequately informed. Sometimes it's because we hear what we wanna hear. Sometimes we don't ask the right questions. But I think more often than not, it really is an issue a lot of physicians have because they don't like telling bitter truths to families. And we need to be able to prepare them that we're gonna be honest with them. We don't have a crystal ball. We can't tell you the, the moment and the hour. We can't a lot of times even predict the day. A lot of that is a power that's higher than us. And a lot of it is actually up to the patient and the family of where they are on that trajectory of acceptance. I've seen patients who are ready to go. They say goodbye. And, you know, we had this happen just a 
a few weeks ago where the patient really wanted hospice, really wanted to be on hospice, and the family was against it. And the patient asked the entire team to meet with the family outside of the room, and we did. And the family began to have a better understanding of what the patient was up against. And when they went back in the room and asked the patient how they want to be cared for, the patient said, I'm tired of fighting. I want to rest. I want to be kept comfortable. And so then the family went back out again and they met and they all agreed as a family. It was the, the adult children all agreed that that's what they would do and they would not send the patient back to the hospital one more time. And when they went back in and told the patient how brave they thought they were and the amount of courage that they thought it took to have this conversation with them, the patient actually began to tell some stories and began to communicate with the family about how meaningful that was for them to tell them they were brave, admire their courage, and to give them permission to let go. And within just within the hour, just 30, or excuse me, within just 60 minutes of that, the patient let go and passed away. So the patient had been entirely awake and communicating and then closed their eyes after sharing some old stories and, and passed away quietly and peacefully and comfortably and did not even require any pain medication. So the family, you know, came away thinking this can be a beautiful thing. We were so unprepared though. And I do hear that often, that families feel like they knew their loved one, and this is exactly what this case was, they knew their loved one was ill, they knew their loved one had been fighting for a very, very long time, but they didn't realize they were that tired mentally, physically, emotionally, and that they were ready to go and that they felt like now is the time. The entire family is here, I need the entire family to tell me that it's okay to let go, and I can be comfortable now. I don't want to fight anymore. So not having to fight those symptoms, not having to think about tomorrow, but they'd not eaten in several days. They'd only been having bites and sips. And when, when we arrived, when our team arrived, the individual explained to us, please help my family understand where I am on this trajectory. And they passed away so comfortably. The family felt like even though they knew they'd been sick, that the end of this illness rushed upon them and they did not have the time to prepare. The family was concerned that there are a lot of mortal things that have not been taken care of because we've been so busy providing the care and we've been so busy you know, trying to meet their needs that there are some mortal things that we didn't take care of that now we're gonna have to address. As healthcare providers, we are committed to alleviate suffering. And that's why we will ask many different times and many different ways about how the patient is feeling, not just physically feeling, but emotionally feeling, and what we can do. Is there a way I can address what your needs are? We also want the patient to know that even though you've chosen not to go back to the hospital and you don't want to have aggressive measures done, it doesn't mean we're going to abandon you. We're going to stay with you throughout the duration of this and we're going to be right there with you. We're going to support your family and we're going to help you be in the environment that you want to be at the end of life. And sometimes when patients hear that, they are so relieved to know that their family is going to be given the tools that they need to be able to provide for them and take care of them in that home environment. One of the ways that we like to help prepare that family is we like to coach them on an ongoing basis about what end of life looks like so that they're prepared and that they're not alarmed. One of the most concerning things for family is they don't see the, the patient eat anymore. And many times throughout my career, I've had families say, I think they're gonna to starve to death because they don't eat anymore. They don't wanna have any food anymore. And I see that as the chicken and the egg. And it's not that the patient is dying because they're not eating. Now at this point, the patient is no longer eating because they're dying. They know that they don't need that nutrition anymore. And the journey that they're about to embark on, that's not the kind of food that, food that they need anymore. We have the aides come by the patient's house and they will provide that personal care. If the patient is in a family member's home or if they're in an ALF, they will assist with that care in whatever environment that they're in. The social worker, 
the bereavement coordinator, they're going to go by and visit that patient and family and find out what elements of mental health needs there are and how they can help meet those needs. And they're also going to talk quietly with the family and if the patient wants to be involved, they'll include them about measures of care that are to occur after the patient has passed away. Some families don't have any idea how to prepare for a funeral or what they're going to need, and those people specialize in that. It's just something that they do every day, so it's not something that's going to be upsetting for the for us or for the bereavement coordinator or the social worker. We want to provide the assistance that the family needs to prepare for those events to occur so that they can have everything in order for what they need to do and how they need to be prepared. The nurse and the nurse practitioner will also be going by quite frequently when they see that decline occurring and that that person sleeping more and more and eating less and drinking less. They may need to change pain medications. They may need to take away blood pressure pills. They certainly don't need to be on a cholesterol medication when they're in the last few weeks or days of life. So a lot of those medications are going to be reduced and discontinued. The patient may need a visit by a physician as well. Sometimes patients and families have questions or they have concerns and they may need reassurance and that's fine. The physician can come by the house as well. So we want to make sure that if there's a need or a request that that's being addressed. Many times when the physician goes by and it's close to the end of life, that's what the concern is. Are we doing everything that we should have done? I need reassurance that I've provided for my loved one and that physician's going to be able to address those questions and reassure those families. There can also be volunteers that come by. Many times families already have pets, so they already have neighbors that are coming by and sharing experiences with that patient and with that family to show that they care and they're going to be there and support that family through that experience and then after that death has occurred. Signs and symptoms of what we see when the patient is really approaching that end of life. They're going to be sleeping more as we said and sometimes that's what we call hypoactive delirium. They're not exactly confused, but they may kind of, it's like they're transitioning between this world and the next. They may see people that aren't there. Sometimes they will talk to people that have already passed away, whether it's parents or siblings or other loved ones. They may have their eyes open as they get closer and closer to the end of life. We can see skin changes, particularly in the coloring of the skin. So sometimes they have difficulty with temperature control and they may get hot easily, they may run a fever, they may get cold easily. So sometimes we'll see what we call modeling, a lot of times on the knees or the feet, and it's not exactly that they're not getting enough oxygen, it's not cyanosis, it's just that those blood vessels and capillaries are not opening and closing appropriately, and so sometimes there's some discoloration that can occur that we call modeling. They may have their head back, their eyes open, and you may see their jaw drop or you may see some jaw movements with each and every breath. Certainly the breathing is going to slow down and sometimes it can be irregular. One of the things I try to educate uh, the learners when I have medical students or residents is that You may think that this individual is breathing too fast because they're short of breath, but it could be that they're uncomfortable. So sometimes what they need is a little dose of pain medication and then stay bedside for the next 20 minutes, next 45 minutes, and see what happens to that person's breathing. Does that breathing steady down to where it's more regular in and out respiration that does not look like that person's panting, like maybe they're hot or maybe they're anxious. But when that breathing slows down and the breathing may be 8 or 12 times a minute, that's pretty typical. So if you've got a loved one who's approaching the end of life, their respirations probably shouldn't be in the 20s and 30s or certainly not in the 40s. And they should be even and regular. So we would like for that breathing pattern to be on a regular basis and to be even so that it looks like that person is comfortable. Not drinking, so they're not likely to be urinating. They're not eating much. They may only have a small amount of waste. They may not have a regular bowel movement. That's pretty typical. A lot of times we don't do blood pressures anymore as a person reaches the end of life because those cuffs 
can be really uncomfortable and their blood pressure is going to be dropping anyway. So you may not be able to get a good blood pressure. You might be able to feel a pulse at the wrist. You might be able to feel a pulse at the neck or in the upper part of the arm, but they may not have a good blood pressure anymore. And that's pretty typical. Assessment of pain, like I said before, sometimes it's the family that tells us they're uncomfortable, but we can certainly see it in an individual's face. If they have a furrowed brow, if it looks like they're grimacing, if they're grunting or holding their breath and then panting, all of those can be signs of discomfort and pain. A lot of times if you ask them if they're in pain, they may say no. But if you ask them if they're comfortable, they may be a little bit more willing to be honest and tell you that they're not comfortable. And then you can find out more about is, you know, is it anxiety that's causing them to be uncomfortable? Are they having discomfort in their back or in their muscles? And then you can address the appropriate symptom with the appropriate medication. And if it's pain related, you can give them something for pain. If it's shortness of breath, you might also use a medication to ease that shortness of breath, which may be the same medication used to alleviate their pain. But if it's anxiety, if they're worried, if they're fearful, they may, need, they may need a different medication than what you're using for pain. Another common event to occur at the end of life is fever. And sometimes they can have just a low grade fever of 99 or 100, and it may not be a significant fever, but it can still cause them to be uncomfortable. A lot of times patients may tell you that they, they feel tired, they feel like they've got a headache, and they may just have a 99 temp. And if you can give them a little Tylenol, that will ease that symptom for them and that fever will come down. If an individual has a malignancy, sometimes that fever can get pretty high. If they've got an infection, certainly that can be a sign of causing the fever, but not always does a fever indicate infection not at the end of life. Something that we like to make sure we talk with cardiac patients in particular is do they have a cardiac device, an AICD that's gonna shock them and restart the heart. Now remember that, that that implantable defibrillator device is only going to deliver a shock if it's a shockable rhythm. If the patient's heart completely stops, it's not going to deliver a shock. But if they go into an arrhythmia, it is possible that that individual is gonna be shocked and they may not want that at that point in their life. So if they, if they don't want that AICD, we can either put the magnet on over their chest, or we can have the representative from that company go out and turn off the shock part. We don't turn off pacemakers, but we do turn off the AICD portion. We wanna know if the patient is able to swallow those medications. Do we need to crush them? Do we need liquids? How much fluids are they taking? Sometimes all they need is just a few ice chips or some swabs to moisten their mouth. And then we can either crush those medications and, and make a little paste, or we can give them small amounts of liquid. If it's pain, and the patient is not able to, for some reason, take medications, many hospice agencies in the home can start different medications, either maybe by a topical or by an infusion to alleviate that symptom of pain and shortness of breath. Signs of death that we see are, of course, the absence of the heartbeat. There's no, no more breathing. The pupils become fixed and dilated. The body temperature is going to drop over just the next few minutes, not like within five minutes, but within 20, 30 minutes, the body temperature is going to drop. And then we're going to see those muscles relax, those sphincters relax. Sometimes if the patient has not emptied their bladder or emptied their bowels in a period of time, those muscles may relax. And you may hear a sigh as they exhale for that last time. And those are some of the signs that we see at the end of life. And if you've got a hospice agency that you've been using, if you haven't already called them by this point, it's a time for you to call them and tell them, I think my loved one has passed and I really need someone to come out and to evaluate them. Now, if the family gets uh, anxious or gets upset and they end up calling 911. 911 can come and can do that assessment, but you want to make sure that you have that yellow community do not resuscitate form or if you're in a state with pulsed uh, orders, physician orders for life sustaining treatments, you're going to want to make sure you have that handy to show that to the 911 people when they arrive so that they don't try to resuscitate your loved one. What happens next after that person passes away? 
So depending on the setting and depending on the location of the patient, they may be at home and you're gonna call the hospice agency and they're gonna notify the funeral home. If it's at the hospital and you don't have funeral arrangements, instead of the funeral home picking that individual up, they may go to the hospital and morgue for a period of time while families make those decisions. If they're in an inpatient setting, usually the social worker has encouraged the families to already make those decisions so that the funeral home will come to that facility and pick that person up, pick the body up and take it for preparation. Most places are gonna allow for that family to spend a little time with the patient and say their last goodbyes. So after death, it's just not like it's just a whirlwind and that patient body is whisked away. They do give you sometimes a, a few hours, three, possibly four hours to spend with that person. So if the patient passes at the hospital or passes in an inpatient unit and for some reason the family is not present, then they're gonna call you, let you know that that individual has passed. And then if you want to go in and see them before the funeral home has picked them up and prepared them, then you let them know that you're gonna to wanna to go in and see that individual. For some families, they don't wanna see the patient right after the passing. They wanna wait until after the funeral home has picked the body up and has prepared that person. Things that we always like to do, we always wanna respect the person their beliefs and their spirituality before, during, and after the passing. So if there is a special preparation for the body, we wanna make sure that we do that. If the person's been in the hospital or if they've got tubes or faulty catheters or if there's wires, if there's some sort of equipment, then we wanna make sure that that equipment is, is taken care of if they've got IV lines or whatever so that that stuff is not on the patient anymore. If the family would like them bathed and dressed, we will offer to do those things. And we want to be aware of any cultural needs or any religious needs that the patients and the families have. If it's a veteran, most all hospices and hospitals have a veteran ceremony that they will participate in and provide for that veteran and for the family to attend. And their, their beautiful ceremony of thanks and gratitude for that veteran and hospices have to comply with certain regulations that the Veterans Association has and Veterans Affairs have established for those services to be provided. So after the body is picked up and taken to the funeral home, then the bereavement coordinator can work with the family on their specific needs and the social worker can assist with those family concerns and that lasts up to 12 or 13 months. Many hospices have uh, organization ties so that children can have their needs met. And so it's not just a, a one day event. It's not just up to the passing and then after the passing of just a few days. It's providing that help, providing that care for a period of time because it's a life altering event for the rest of us when we lose someone out of our life and you have to get all the way around the calendar. You have to meet, meet every one of those events, whether it's a birthday or an anniversary or a holiday, you have to see every one of those that first time without that loved one to get used to it. It's been my personal experience from loss of my own family members that I didn't really feel like I got over it. I felt like I got used to it. So as time passed, I began to be able to talk about it a little bit more openly. I didn't feel like I was so near to tears. There are still certain times of the year and certain events that can you know, make me think back to things that are sad and bring me to the point of tears again but it's not so raw and so difficult as it was right after their passing. We hope that you can find the help you need at the stage and when you need it to provide the care for you and your family member. It's a family event. It's not just for the patient, but it's the whole family we wanna take care of. I would encourage you to Use the palliative providers in your area if you've got access to them in the private sector, like Dr. T, she's got a palliative practice and practices across several states. But many hospitals now have palliative care groups and many hospices also have palliative divisions. 
when the time comes that you need a hospice agency, don't be afraid of a word. Don't be afraid that taboo, if I talk about this, it's going to make it so. We are mortal and death is going to occur for us. So we want to try to address those needs as early as we possibly can because statistics show that people who are on hospice longer live better and have a higher quality of life. Let that hospice agency educate you, educate the family, and watch for those signs that indicate that end of life is nearing, and be with your loved one. Provide that comfort for them, as well as so that later on you're able to look back and know that even though you went through this terrible time, you provided everything you could, you did everything you could, and you met every need, that you bravely helped them face that end of life. Thank you for your attention today, and we'll be back and have more videos. Thank you.